Thank you. I very much appreciate being included as a surgeon on the panel who does endoscopy. But I have to say, I agree with all of the slides in the last presentation, so to start with. But there are caveats, as you all know. The biggest caveat being that most of you don't want to do common bile duct exploration. That's been the biggest impediment to getting that going. I'm going to try to move real quick to catch up some time. And I know um, my case presentations are things you already know, so I'll just move through. Do I push which one here? Um, so, my first question is, when's the best time for, lap, for, for this? Pre-op, if you have documented stones or rising bilirubin with cholangitis, pancreatitis alone is not an indicator. I get asked to do common bile duct stones all the time. You'll see some data on that. But except in the presence of rising bilirubin or cholangitis, introp for patients, if they're found serendipitously or unexpectedly with high anesthesia risk. You don't want to have to put them to sleep for an ERCP again. You suspect it's going to be a difficult case for the endoscopist. You can't get it yourself because of whatever reason. And then post-op. Um, or if, if it's felt that it's difficult to remove when you're in that operation, uh, or it can be found unexpectedly post-op, those become indications when to do it. But laparoscopic versus ERCP, you know, this is one single study, 100 lap coles with, the, with um, common bile duct exploration, 195 lap coli plus ERCP. Basically, there's a little better uh, bile duct clearance with ERCP, although there's another study that shows the opposite. Basically, um, nearly double the number of procedures per patient. Uh, no difference in failure rate of length of state. I like this study, 224 papers reviewed for the four best evidence articles. Conclusion is that a single stage surgical procedure is equivalent to two stage LC and ERCP, but it has a shorter hospital stay and more cost effective. So we should, should be doing that for most of these cases, but let's look at some cases. Another through the Cochrane Library analysis, um, open bile duct surgery better than ERCP with respect to stone clearance. Lap bile duct exploration is equivalent to RCP with respect to all parameters. But it's cheaper and the patients go home faster as we've talked about. But the reason cited by the surgeons to me on the telephone, lack of personal experience or in a small hospital, could you just take the stone out and send the patient back for me to do his little gallbladder? Technical issues during the case, small thin cystic duct, uh, a small bile duct, I don't want to open it. OR didn't have the right materials at hand and the extra time needed to do the procedure, which you know, we've talked about is not a good reason, but it is a reason that people use. Uh, so quite honestly, our biggest impediment is not the aggressive gastroenterologist. I try to turn my patients back to the primary surgeon over and over again, is that surgeons don't like doing them, but maybe that'll improve with all the training. So let's just take a couple of scenarios, and these I'm gonna whip through fast so we'll have more time for discussion. 25-year-old young lady, you know, not terribly sick, white count 14, Billy 1.8, uh, gallstones, um, pre-op ERCP requested and done, and you can see the bile duct stone there. This would have been a very easy one to remove by laparoscopic means. And look at this, I had to put in a pancreatic duct stent. That means this was a difficult cannulation in a young woman with a thin duct and a small ampulla. I don't think this is the best choice uh, in this type of case, but it gets done all the time by GI, probably surgeons pushing that envelope. And I'll guarantee you as a GI guy or as a surgeon doing endoscopy, if I don't do it, I won't get asked again. There's, they're just, they just don't want to really do, you can't just push back to them and say, do the lap common duct. And they don't really want to give you the case to do the lap conduct if you're a surgeon endoscopist. They really want that case back. And of course, the gastroenterologist can't do the lap conduct. So it, that we're, we're in a situation where it's getting pushed forward because of a lot of political reasons. Another case, 27-year-old with pain, white count 12, bilirubin 5, um, ultrasounds and common duct stone. What's interesting about this case is it turns out to be a type of a Maritzi syndrome with a stone stuck at the confluence of the common hepatic duct and cystic duct. It was unable to be extracted endoscopically, so the patient had a complicated ERCP and then goes on to have a stone extraction by operation of T-tube. Again, another case that would have been better started off operatively. Intraoperative, I think this is where we don't use ERCP enough, quite honestly. Um, because not everyone is able to get the stones out. This is a morbidly obese patient. I, it was my patient. Well, the patient wasn't mine. I was called by one of my partners, um, found an unexpected bile duct stone, 
that was a really difficult intubation of the patient's throat. She's very high risk. They didn't want to have to put her to sleep in the future for an ERCP. They tried to get the stone out laparoscopic, couldn't get, get it out for whatever reasons. ERCP was requested in trop. I think that's a good indication. There was the stone, it was kind of obstructing, on table ERCP, wide gar, wire guide can be passed, do a sphincterotomy safely, decrease risk of pancreatitis, and then a stone and stent were, were taken care of. Then the post-operative scenario, again, we talked about this, you know, why do you leave it for post-op? Well, lack of experience is probably the biggest thing. I think this patient could have been done, but it was, it was patient had a, uh, white count of 11, bilirubin 1 1.5. Um, patient did have a stone, several stones in a distal duct. This is a perfect case for someone who's not too experienced to take the stones out with a basket. It's a big, wide cystic duct. It's like a main highway. Uh, but the doctors don't want to do it, and they just put a clip across and call you after the case. I've got a patient for you to do tomorrow morning, which we did. But again, you know, it's a small duct, a small ampulla, you know, the stones were extracted, but this is another case. So out of everything I've showed you, I think the one category that we don't use enough may be intraoperative, um, if you have, can plan that ahead with your, with your buddies. Gallstone pancreatitis, that was alluded to. I think this has some very specific parameters where we can help patients. Um, is, dating back to 88, there are four or five prospective randomized trials, 112 patients. It turns out if patients with severe pancreatitis, if you randomize them to ERCP with sphincterotomy versus conventional treatment, there's decreased mortality and decreased complication rate and, sh and lo shorter hospital days if you do the urgent ERCP. This is the one scenario where ERCP should be done, severe pancreatitis with cholangitis. Um, Stuart Sherman, one of the best GI endoscopists in the country for ERCP, writes, early ERCP does not lead to reduction in mortality or local or systemic complications in the absence of cholangitis. So all these patients being referred for pancreatitis and stone removal should not have an ERCP. There's five randomized controlled trials with 644 patients, early versus um, conservative management, and among all patients, no significant difference in mortality. However, among the patients with cholangitis, mortality has decreased, local complications decreased. Biliary obstruction alone without cholangitis doesn't decrease mortality, but you decrease your local complications. So rising bilirubin, high white count and fever, that needs to go to ERCP for gallstone pancreatitis. Otherwise, leave it alone, let them cool down and take the gallbladder out and do a cholangiogram and find the residual stones and take them out laparoscopically. Well, what about if you do take an, ER, do an ERCP and take the stone out of the bile duct, do you need to go back and do that cholecystectomy? The data says not in all cases. I do it for younger, healthy patients. For older, high-risk patients, I don't. And here's the data that supports that. What's the risk of leaving the gallbladder over time? The operative risk of the risk of return. Here's 193 of 211 patients where stone extraction was successful. They were followed for a mean of 38 months, only 10 required cholecystectomy. So they conclude if the duct can be cleared and sphincterotomy is successful, cholecystectomy is not necessary. Another study, 184 patients followed up for a mean of 74 months. And there, there are prospective trials with this that have been done. 35 patients required cholecystectomy at surgery, only five had recurrent bile duct stones, and they were form, performed within four years. So a routine post-endoscopy post cholecystectomy is not necessary. Now, again, if the patient is 25 years old, to me that's different than if they're 75 years old, and it depends on their operative risks. Um, another study, 33 patients followed up for 21 months, uh, symptoms were, were found in only two patients for cholecystectomy. These are a bunch of studies. Look at the column, uh, the second to the right. Um, and I'm not going to find the pointer here. You know, number of cholecystectomies, 10%, but, you know, it's really not a lot. And these are, a lot of these are prospective studies. So in summary, cholecystectomy is required, and when it becomes symptomatic in about 10%, wait and see is not a bad idea. Endoscopic treatment alone in high-risk patients is a low-risk procedure and successful for patients who, who do have cholelithiasis. Well, what about these very large common bile ducts? Should we do lithotripsy with repeat RCPs versus surgery? Decisions should be based on the extent of stone, stone disease and the risk of recurrent stones. If there's ampullary stenosis or a distal stricture present, the risk of recurrent cholelithiasis is higher, and I think surgery should be considered. 
the potential for cholodoco due to an ostomy is a long-term fix, and they have to pair that against the operative risk. Lithotripsy can be successful, but especially with a large stone burden, requires multiple procedures and anesthesias. Here's a 36-year-old um, ERCP with biliary stent in place for stones, multiple stones. We couldn't get them out without making a real large sphincterotomy, so we did a uh, stone fracture. That's what it looks like with the, col the, the, the operative colodocoscope spyglass. That catheter at the bottom is the hydraulic, electrohydraulic lithotripture, delivers electric shocks to break up the stone. The pieces go into little pieces, and you pull them out, clear the duct, and that's that. Uh, now, here's the other side of this story. Um, so that patient did fine, had a couple of sessions. 56-year-old guys didn't really want operative intervention, um, so we did multiple ERCPs, extracted all the stones, multiple states. Sta Finally, he comes back, and then he has um, recurrent stone. We end up doing a colodoco duodenostomy. Because when you get this kind of ampullary stenosis at the end and poor drainage, they're going to have recurrent stones. So despite an adequate sphincterotomy, he continues to form stones. And that's a patient who needs a side-to-side -side colodoco duodenostomy. Shame we didn't do it at the outset, especially at age 56. Probably should have, but we didn't with that stone burden. So, and then, uh, what are the risks of endoscopic intervention in patients who are post-colcystectomy or don't have gallstones? These are the young women who come to your office with pain, and they might even have an elevated bilirubin, or they have an MRI that has a questionable stone. These are, you better beware, because these are high-risk patients for management by ERCP. 55-year-old young woman, white count LFT is normal, has pain, gets an MRI, shows a distal bile duct stone. Well, we do the RCP, there's no stone. So you do a sphincterotomy or you don't. Well, we did in this case because I thought that looked like an abnormal ampulla, maybe causing her problem, et cetera. But again, that's a, a difficult category of patients, but ERCP rather than surgery is probably indicated uh, for those people. Um, so. Acute cholangitis, this is a no-brainer. I'm not going to spend any time on it. Everybody seems to know this, but there's good prospective data, less risk, better outcome and survival with ERCP first. Do a sphincterotomy, pus comes out, put a stent, patients go home. The rules of the game, ERCP only after the patient gets fluid resuscitation and antibiotics. Do a quick sphincterotomy and get out. Don't go over-inject the duct and get into other problems. Fluid and careful monitoring post-procedure. I'm not going to talk about the post-gastric bypass patients to give us more time uh, to have our discussion. This is my last little section on post-gastric bypass because it was handled very well by the other uh, speaker. Uh, post-gastric bypass has an option of doing a transgastric um, approach where you put a tube in the stomach and do a sphincterotomy, or you can do the laparoscopic common duct stone excision. The only point I'll point out is the advantage of the endoscopic approach is we do a large sphincterotomy, and a lot of these people have ampullary dysfunction, and that's why the stone formed. Therefore, there should be give consideration given to colodoco do an anostomy in those cases versus the, the um, gastric bypass. But let's discuss this. We need time for discussion. This is a great topic. Thank you very much.